Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope uh, you had a good time so far at DevOx. Today, my talk is about uh, Google's mission critical database, relational database called Spanner. And I'm myself, I'm Robert Kubis. I'm a developer advocate for the Google Cloud Platform. What does that mean? We understand our job as like a bi directional job, job between developers outside of the company that work or that build things on top of our platform, so you guys, and the people that build these things, these, the platform inside the company, so the Google employees and the uh, SOEs and SWEs and, and so on, the software developers. So we, please reach out to me if you have any things of like constructive feedback, if you have issues with our platform, if you have some cool ideas that uh, you want to discuss, things like that, you can find me on Twitter or on GitHub under the uh, link Hossi All right, what I'm uh, going to talk about today. So first, I'm going to start off with a brief history, uh, how it all came about that we built Spanner within Google, and then provide the explanation, like what means loud Spanner, so what is the difference between these two systems, and we'll also dive into a little bit of an architecture, how it all works. And last but not least, I will show you a demo. Uh, so like some first steps with Spanner and what you can do. So how did we build and why did we build Spanner? So let's go back about 12 years in 2005. And at that point, Google was built or the whole business in Google was built on top of a shard at MySQL. And like every time, and that sharding was based on a customer ID. Now that was basically backing our ad system back at the day, and there, like our business was growing rapidly, and we needed to, to regularly reshard the database. Now the last reshard that we did took actually over two years, and at that point we were basically like we cannot grow anymore with this system underneath, and there was no suitable system on the market what could fill our needs. Um, now there were a couple of things that were really important for us. Google was a 24-7, or is still today, a 24-7 business. Like, um, ads are sold all around the world, right? So we, we needed a system that has no downtime. If there are any like security updates, or any patches, or any schema changes, we needed a system that supports no downtime uh, updates of these things. Also, what is really important is we, was, we were dealing with budgets. We were dealing with people's money, customers' money, with our money. Uh, there were deadlines. There were things that had to be done. So we needed a global consistency. And we needed asset transactions in the system. And uh, of course, because I just said, like we, we, had a sh we, we had a shard at MySQL at that point, we needed a system which basically can grow with our need, with the fast pace that we were growing from like a $10 million business to over a billion dollar business uh, in a couple months and years. We needed a system that can actually scale with our needs. So we built Spanner inside Google uh, to back our mission critical systems. Things like uh, the ad system, but nowadays also a lot of the other systems, a lot, many, many of the, our systems and products are built on top of, of Spanner. One of the examples, for instance, Gmail. So we have a lot of uh, products over, with over a billion users that are actually backed by Spanner. Now, to make that available to all of you, we had to do a couple of things. First, we wanted to offer it as a fully managed service. So we needed to integrate it with, with what was there already under the Google Cloud Platform portfolio and all the things um, that came with it. So um, we also wanted to have a system which is easy to use in the way that you can use it in a, uh, that you're familiar with from MySQL or Postgres. So it was very important for us that we support things like schemas, um, transaction, and SQL semantics. And the system also, what is really important there is um, that this system is global scale, basically mean you can have it replicated across continents. Now this replication is really important. We don't want to accept eventual consistency, so we wanted to have a system which actually synchronously or almost synchronously uh, replicates across regions. And what you get as well is a system that is battle tested within Google uh, over like almost 10 years by now. So, Google claims, and we want it to be the, the open cloud. 
which basically means we wanted to use uh, standards that are familiar in, in the ecosystem. And we also wanted to build in a lot of things that are cri mission critical for enterprises that might that want to use Cloud Spanner. So some of the things that come with it is things like encryption, like all the data on REST is encrypted. Uh, we have implemented audit logging, identity and access management, things like that. But also really important for us was when we were working with our early access program uh, participants that we build client libraries which are easy to use and um, idiomatic to the languages uh, that we offer. So currently we have Java, Python, Go, and Node.js, but there are more client libraries uh, coming up. We also open source the gRPC uh, protobuf based like uh, API, so you can also build your own clients if you want to. And we have currently only a read-only one, but we have currently a GDPC driver which allows to integrate Cloud Spanner with a lot of the BI tools that are existing out there. All right, so how does it compare to like things like traditional SQL databases, relational databases, or to no SQL databases, which became more and more popular in the recent couple, or like last decade, I would say. Um, if you compare it to a traditional RDBMS, what is obvious is like most RDBMS out of the box only support a vertical scaling. So basically, if your business grows, you kind of have to hope that your cloud provider offers a better, yes, have a question? Oh, never mind. Um, so you have to basically hope that the, your cloud provider offers a bigger instance, right? Um, so that your business can grow. Or you have to go into the world of sharding your relational database management system. Now, if you go into the world of sharding, basically it's usually a lot, a lot of hassle that you have to deal with. Sharding is not easy. It's really complicated, especially if you go very fast and have to reshard. And um, you mostly, many, most of the times, where if you look at the big relational databases, you lose some of the qualities from uh, these relational database systems. And many times you have to build, for instance, your transactions on top uh, in, your, in your application logic on top of your sharded um, database system. Now, Apart from that, if you look at like schema SQL and consistencies, they are both supported by a traditional relational database system and by Cloud Spanner. Now, when it comes to availability and scalability, if you look at, for instance, uh, for availability and you have a MySQL with a full failover instance, even if you have a planned failover, you will have some downtime. So you will definitely incur some downtime even if you do a planned failover to your failover instance uh, when you basically do an, an update of your operating system or patches or something like that on your master. Another thing is like if you look at the read replicas, now you can use read replicas to free your master a little bit from the, the workload basically and concentrate writes on your master in a sharded system. This way you can scale a bit, uh, bit more, but still you're limited by the vertical scalability of your, of your master. Now when we come to the NoSQL world, you, you give up a lot of the criteria that, that many of us loved from a traditional database system. But the thing is, since the traditional database system restricts your growth, a lot of people went and a lot of developers choose NoSQL biting uh, the bullet of having things like not very rigid schemas sometimes, not uh, an SQL support most of the times, and eventual consistency or tweakable, tweakable um, consistency. In a way that like if you tweak your consistency in a way that you want to have strong consistency, you usually you slow down your system that far that it's almost like unusable. So you have horizontal scalability, but by giving up um, the consistency. Now Spanner basically, the way its Spanner is built, combines these two worlds in a way that you get the best out of both. I want to cover a couple, like touch only a little bit on some traditional or typical workloads that we are seeing with, with Spanner. And some of them I mentioned already like on, on the side. So really important if, uh, for instance, if you have a lot of writes and reads that you need to scale, where you need basically horizontal scale, that's something where um, Spanner comes in and you want to have them uh, basically transactional. 
Another thing is, for instance, uh, if you have an ID service or if you want to have like a global data plane, where right, you want to have a global consistent uh, database for certain things that are really important that they are transactional. For instance, as an example, Google Cloud Platform, everything that the user does, basically starting VMs and things like that, um, are backed by Spanner as like the global data plane. Also, what we see is data consolidation. So Spanner doesn't have the restrictions of like a couple of terabyte uh, of data that you can manage with it. You can actually manage um, tens to hundreds up to petabyte of data in, in Spanner. So you don't have the data restriction, which basically offers you the possibility to load data into Spanner and consolidate data there, instead of having like your traditional database system and uh, ETL the data out into like another data warehouse, then merge it with some data from a NoSQL database and do your analytics on that. So now let's, let's go a little bit more in detail, like how Spanner, like there were a lot of claims that I just made, like how, how does it actually work and how does Spanner uh, solve a lot of the issues that we are seeing out there. So in Spanner, what is really important is that the compute and storage is separated. So they are in the, like independent of each other. And if, if you get a regional instance, you get basically an instance that is replicated across three zones. So that is the example here. I have a regional instance. Um, that instance in this example has three nodes. Each node is replicated three times. In, so basically you have, like if you buy one node, I would see like one of these little hexagons on, on the top for each zone. And then we have the storage, which is um, also uh, basically in each of the regions we have dedicated storage, uh, which has the replicated data as well. Now, if you look at the constructs that we have in Spanner, we have an instance to start with. We have databases, up to a couple hundred databases that you can create per instance. So the instance I just uh, explained what an instance is in terms of compute and, and storage. And each database, of course, has tables. That's very familiar from a traditional database system. Now, to be able to horizontally scale, we split these tables into so-called split, and we use these splits to basically distribute work uh, among these tables, and I'm gonna do, go in a little bit more detail about this. So if you look at this, basically you have like these uh, compute engine instances or instances that I have there that are responsible for a split. Uh, in each zone, I have one compute engine instance which is responsible for a split and then these build a Paxos group. And this Paxos group is used basically as a leader selection, and that Paxos group is used to make sure that we have at most one leader for any data piece, so to say. So, um, and by having only one leader for a data piece, we can make, that is basically one of the primary criteria to have strong consistency. So there can never be two leaders for some data, which basically accept right, uh, rights on that data, and if you would have two leaders, you could get inconsistencies across your distributed database. So we have at most one leader and we use Paxos to choose this leader. Now what is really important there is uh, how do you make that possible across the globe? And one of the innovations that we used in, in Spanner is to avoid a lot of communication. So one way that you can do is, of course, you can always communicate. Um, but communication, especially across continents, takes time and would slow down your database a lot. So we wanted to remove as much co uh, communication as possible. And one of the innovations that we did there is we invented the time, so a global time service we, that we call through time. Now, there's NTC out there. Why is it different? The thing is, it's really hard to actually synchronize clocks. It's really hard to synchronize clocks here in that room, even though if you sit next to your neighbor and you synchronize clocks, you go out a little bit, come back a couple of days, your, your, your clocks will diverge. Uh, clocks are very heavily, um, or are influenced by things like temperature, atmospheric rays, things like that, right? So it's really difficult to actually synchronize these clocks. And the way that we, what we needed is basically, we needed a service that quantifies this uncertainty of um, unsynchronization, basically. 
And that's what, what true time is. So we invented that during the creation of Spanner, and it basically quantifies the uncertainty of my time, of my global wall clock time. So if I want to get a global wall clock time in, in the US or in, in Poland, and I want to make sure that both my data centers have the same time, I basically need to quantify the uncertainty. And so true time gives you a time bound. It gives you a lower uh, time bound and an upper time bound. It basically gives you an interval. And that interval basically says that the timestamp one, the lower interval, is a timestamp that has passed everywhere in the world. And the upper timestamp is a timestamp that uh, says that this timestamp has not passed anywhere in the world. So you have to basically these two timestamps, and using these two timestamps, you can make sure that you have at most one leader for a data piece, and by that you can get actually strong consistency and the highest quality of strong consistency, which is serializability. So how do we do this, the synchronization? What we use is a mix out of GPS and atomic clocks. So we have so-called time masters in all our data centers. And we synchronize these time masters with, G with GPS. And we get down to a couple of milliseconds of this interval, which I uh, told you. Um, now, these clocks drift over time, so we basically resynchronize these clocks every roughly 30 seconds. And so when, when I want to get a time, and like my spanner node wants to get a time, it basically goes to these time masters and it gets a quorum out of like atomic clocks and GPS clocks and basically uses this quorum to get this true time timestamp. Now, what happens if, for instance, in a data center, the entire timing system like fails? In that case, we get a timestamp, a true timestamp from a different data center and we calculate in the, the travel time. All our networks are owned by ourselves, so we can make very, very uh, good estimates in terms of like how long something travels from one to the other. So we basically calculate in that latency that we have for getting this through timestamp from a different data center. And then what happens is Spanner basically slows down, but it won't stop. So let's go through it with some more practical examples. The first one what I want to do is a consistent read. So I, I select basically all events where the name is uh, DevOps PL. And so first the client sends a request that send, like let's assume that request goes to a follower. So we have leaders and followers in our Pexus group or leaders and slaves, slave is not a good word, let's say a follower. Um, so I have a follower basically in my Pexus group and that request comes into that follower. Now, the follower will basically say, uh, ask the leader of that data piece, which I want to read, like, hey, do I have the latest data? Now, if the leader responds back, yeah, that, that, that's the timestamp of the latest data, then the follower will respond with the data. So only communication is basically to check if, if I have the latest. Now, what happens in the case that the follower doesn't have the latest data? Like, the start is the same, the leader will respond with, no, like my timestamp is later, please wait, wait out the time till you have this latest timestamp. It will basically send the timestamp of the latest data, and the data is most likely already in flight to, uh, the, to, to the replica. So the replica will basically wait out that time using true time, and then uh, respond with the data. Now, um, there is, like for scalability reasons, also the possibility to do so-called stale reads, uh, time-bound reads. That it comes especially handy if you use a multi-regional setup of Spanner where you have it replicated across the globe. So for instance, an instance in US, Europe, and Asia. Now with time-bound reads, what you can basically do is you might uh, avoid asking the leader if you have the latest data. So basically here in this example, I say I want to read the events and because the event data doesn't change very not, a lot and it's not part of a read-write transaction here. I'm basically sending a request and say like, hey, it's okay if you send me data that is up to 15 seconds old. Now the, slave, uh, the follower will basically check, do I have the, what is my latest timestamp of the data piece? And when it is in this time, within this time bound of 15 seconds, it will basically respond. 
And that timestamp will be updated with a heartbeat. Now, in a read-write transaction scenario, the uh, client basically is routed directly to, to the leader of the Paxos group. And the leader of the Paxos group will acquire logs, then we'll send back the query results. We do some calculations, for instance, we buffer some writes, we send these writes to, to the leader again, and the leader will basically send out the write to the Paxos group. And as soon as it gets back a quorum of uh, acknowledged writes, it will basically send back, uh, it will release the logs and then send back the, the transaction succeeded. So Spanner, in terms of like the data formats and schema are like the ones that you're familiar with from a relational database. So we have tables with rows and columns, and these are strongly typed, so uh, normal uh, SQL data types that you uh, know. The SQL dialect that we speak with Spanner is SQL ANSI 2011 with extensions. So we have a couple of extensions um, where I'm gonna show one as well in a later demo. Now, there are no foreign key constraints that you might be used from like MySQL or Postgres or other, any other major database vendor where you have basically referential constraints and in, uh, referential integrity that you can have. Now, we don't have that support in Spanner because it's very um, against like distribution. It's very difficult to, to have that in a distributed system. But we have like a foreign, foreign key constraint minus minus. And that's we call interleaved uh, tables. Now, what are interleaved tables? Interleaved tables are basically co-location of data. Now, I told you that tables are split up uh, into splits by ranges, and these splits are done on the basis of the primary key. And it's basically a, um, a range from the, uh, from, the, from the primary key where you split up. Now, if you do certain things, like certain data that you very often join, then you can, and you would benefit from data co-location, then you can interleave these. So what you would have here is, for instance, a singers ta like a singer's table and some songs from that band here in this case, and I would interleave the songs for, with, the, with the band. And that way, if I basically look up albums where I wanna have all the titles of an album uh, for like a certain uh, band, I would basically have that data co-located. Now, there are some restrictions to that. Um, you can go multiple levels down, and you can uh, do multiple interleaves, but you have to be careful with interleaves in the terms of, like, all these are stored in one split, basically from the root. So if you have one row here, that one row lives in a split, and everything which is interleaved. So if you have one row which has, like, a huge table interleaved, then you go into the um, boundaries of what a split can basically uh, support. And that boundary is around two gigabytes. So you should not have like a, a one row which has like an entire two gigabit table interleaved. Another thing is like, of course, you have limits in terms of like scalability for your compute because everything lives in one split. Everything is controlled and managed by one compute uh, instance. So you basically also limit and distribute your query, query uh, execution. Another very important part is that we support things like no downtime schema migrations. So you can change, um, like for instance, if you have a string and you have a, like max characters in your string, you can change the max of the characters. Um, you can add columns, uh, you can delete columns, but of course you have to make sure that you are in, in, within like certain bounds. Like you cannot change the type of a column, for instance. Now, schema updates are transactional, so they basically get a timestamp as well, which you can possibly use if you basically build uh, applications on top of it, you can use that timestamp when a, when a schema update finished to, to accommodate that in your applications. So what are a couple of schema design don'ts that you might be doing in a vertical scalable relational database, which are a poison for doing in, in Spanner? So one of the things really important is not using monotonically increasing or decreasing primary keys. That be like an auto-incremented integer ID or that be a timestamp. So for instance, if you 
want to store logs in Spanner and you use the timestamp of when a request has happened, this basically goes all in the, into your last split of your table and you're, sp you're hotspotting that split. So you basically make it un un impossible for Spanner to distribute your writes in that case. So you don't use uh, any like increasing or decreasing um, primary keys. And as I mentioned before, also be, be careful with interleaving. We have a couple of docs on our, on our web page which describe the best practices around schema design and query design for Cloud Spanner. Um, so this is what I just explained. If you have a timestamp that is monitorly increasing, you basically go with all of them to one node and that one node would hotspot it. Now what can you do to avoid this? One of the uh, uh, possibilities is for, for instance using a UID version four, which is well distributed. And you can either use that as a primary key and that you basically can distribute your writes really easily. Now if you have an existing schema and you want to migrate that into Spanner and you have like a running ID, uh, one of the solutions what you can do is adding basically a prefix with a sharding ID. So you can basically uh, uh, add a prefix, a sharded index, a sharded ID, and that way you can distribute that load as well. Especially if you think of like keeping counters in your database, that is also a good, good well uh, practice is to shard that counter with a sharding ID. And that, if you do this, you basically prefix the shard and enable by that that the, the writes are distributed among your compute uh, power that you have available. All right, so let's have a look and like how a spanner uh, actually works. Now, your starting point is basically cloud.google.com slash spanner, where you find the wells of like spanner documentation. Um, what I want to point out is the, the case studies. So one of our early access program uh, participants, Quizlet, wrote a very elaborate blog around how they migrated from a sharded MySQL to spanner and what kind of steps they had to take. Um, really good read, it talks a lot about best practices around spanner. Now to get started with Spanner, um, you basically, it is a fully managed service. So to get started, you go to the cloud console. Um, we have a free trial if, if you want to try it. And you type in your Spanner instance name. It gets automatically an instance ID. You can change that and then you can choose a region. Currently we support four regions. I choose Europe West here in this case, and let's say we do 15 nodes, and then I create. And within seconds, you basically have an instance available for you. That's how fast, like, um, you get basically a database at your hands. So there's no need to install MySQL or Postgres and wait an hour till it's done. Um, or nowadays, you can start it in a container, but let's not talk about that. But what you can do here is you can create a database. And let's create a database. Like you can do that in that dialogue. You can do if, you, if you're familiar with SQL and you want to do it in SQL, you can of course do it in SQL as well. I'm not going to show my crappy uh, DDL um, skills. So let's do a singers table. And then I'm adding a name for instance and I am adding say it's string and I want to have max length is fine and then I have a primary key and I'm gonna create and I'm done. So basically that's how easy you start and create a table. Now I can of course, as mentioned, edit the schema and for instance add a column here and say like I wanna have an H column, create that. And now if we reload that page and look at it, we will see that there is a schema update in progress and that basically runs in a transaction and will finish at some point. Now I want to go to a preloaded database that I have pre prepared. Um, and that database is based, like I created a schema, sample schema to run some, some queries on. And so what is this? So this is basically a ticket selling demo that I built. 
And in that ticket selling demo, it's really important that I sell each ticket exactly once and only once. But I want to sell all my tickets. I don't want to have unhappy customers where I sold the ticket twice or things like that, especially if you have like seats where people are sitting. Now, I have here all uh, the revolves uh, around is basically events. Now, these events can be grouped in multi-events. For instance, if you have a tour, like a tour of a, of a band or like you have a soccer uh, league or things like that. These events have, um, are happening in venues, and these venues have seating categories. So for instance, you have like VIP seating, premium seating, general seating, things like that. Now for each event, you want to have different prices for these seating categories. So we have also a ticket category, which is connected to the seating category, and basically gives us um, the different pricing for this. And as you can see here, the, we interleave the seating category into the venue table to be basically able, because we pull, if you pull a venue, we always pull the seating categories, so we wanted to co-locate it. And then we have tickets, basically, which we create for each of the events based on a link to the seating category and the ticket category, and um, like for all of these tables, like events and tickets, we can have some additional information. You also see some counters that I'm keeping. And if you look at these counters, uh, what is impar important here is that I have a shard. Now this is here actually at the bottom, but the, um, which is fine because it's basically by event category and customer region. Um, but I basically use here a shard to be able to distribute the rights. So first thing that I want to do is I want to run a query. Now this query is gone. So I copy it here put it back in here. So what is this query doing? It's basically selecting all the events that are happening in, that are happening today here um, from 1 p.m., so what just passed, and then till like 11 p.m. Uh, tonight. No, actually a couple days later, two days later. And I want to have all the events that are happening and the seats that are available and the seats that are total basically available and all these events are happening here in, in Poland. Now when I run this um, query, I'm gonna get back my response, of course, and I also get in, in the developer console a query execution plan. And now that allows me to basically inspect my query, like what is done, what is done behind the scenes, where do I have table scans, where do I use indexes, uh, how do I distribute the workload, things like that. And I also, of course, have uh, information about like how many rows were read. So in this case, I'm reading about 15,000 rows, which is not majorly a lot. But I'm also seeing that for my event table, I'm using a table scan. And now I know this query very well, because I designed it, and I know that I have an index on my table event, and um, it's not used. So what I can do here is, and that is one part of the extensions, I actually can force an index. And that is like something that is available in many, many of the relational databases where you can basically give uh, query execution hints or compiler hints for, for your queries. So in this case, I want to have event by date as my index. I run it again. It runs a bit faster, and as you can see now, I scanned only about um, one-fifth of the row that I scanned before. And if I go down here, I see that now the index is used. Now, as a developer, how do you get started with, with Cloud Spanner? And I want to show here a Java example. Uh, I also have a Go example, but I think the audience, who here is a Java developer? Okay, I think that's the majority. Um, so I'm gonna show a ex Java example. The first thing that I do is a read-only transaction. Now, what we always need is some kind of authentication and authorization, and Google uh, client libraries make that very easy if you're running on your laptop, for instance, with a context set up in, in our, with our client library um, or our client um, SDK. So you get basically a context, and I'm logged in for a project, and that context can be picked up from the environment. Now, this also works if you run, for instance, on a Google Compute Engine instance that also gets a context which you can pick up um, this way. 
So I basically just get like the application default credentials here. And then the next thing that what I want to do is, of course, create basically my database client. So I get a couple of options. I'm setting my instance ID, I'm setting my database, and then I'm getting a client. Now, for my read-only transaction, I basically say I want to use a single-use read-only transaction. So I don't want to do multiple um, queries. I just want to use it once, and I'm done. And then I'm r running my query. So in this query, very similar to the one that we have just seen, is basically I'm getting this transaction object here, and then I'm creating a query where I'm reading the multi-events uh, that are happening between today and tomorrow. So I'm having like some pure parameter markers down here. So I have the state uh, parameter marker and here the next day parameter marker. I'm filling them in uh, down here. Something like very familiar with. And last but not least, I of course have to read my result set. So as we are familiar with iterating through and then I do uh, printf, right, let's do it the easy way, like this. And you basically, uh, since I'm selecting here the multi-event ID and the name of the multi-event, I'm just basically getting that result set um, element for each of the rows that I'm iterating through. Now you can use here the uh, uh, marker, the position in your result set basically, the column position, or you can use also the column name if you have to find that for your, for your query. So let's run this. And that is basically running against my uh, European um, sample database, which I have here. And you see, like, I limited it on, onto 10 elements. I'm getting back my, my multi-events. Now, the next thing what I want to do is I want to do a read-only, a write-only transaction. Now, same thing. I'm getting all my stops done. And then there's something different here. So what I'm doing here is I'm writing a, color, a row into my account table. And what I'm having here in my account table is basically an account ID, uh, which is where I generate a UID version 4. I'm setting a name, a country code, an email address, um, tickets. Basically, I assign the tickets to an account to do a quick lookup. Um, since I'm not uh, having any tickets, I'm setting that to null, and I'm packaging all of this into a so-called mutation. Now, what is a mutation? Mutations are important to, to know in Spanner. So basically, a mutation is on, on the cell level. So, so to, for the scalability reasons, Spanner supports for transactions up to 20,000 mutations. Now, what, what is a mutation? A mutation is basically every cell that you write or update in your table is a mutation. And now imagine you have a table with five columns, like here in my account table. If I write a row in this account table, I'm updating five cells, so that accounts basically to five uh, mutations. Now if I have an index defined on my account table for another two rows, that I, another two columns that I in DC, then this would be added, which basically means I have seven up to, uh, seven mutations per insert into my table. So that is important, that is a limitation that you have to be aware of. Like you will get notified if you run over, but that's something to be um, worried about. And the next thing is also in terms of transactions, like what is the size that we recommend? Like a sweet spot for getting like very high uh, throughput is about one to 10 megabyte per transaction. And that enables you uh, to get with about 80 nodes of Spanner, we were able to load about one gigabyte of data, and it's probably possible to actually go even higher than that. All right, so in this case, I'm running and creating a, a record, and I get a timestamp back when this record was written. And so if I go in my timetable, I'm seeing now here that I have written a record. The next thing is um, a read-write transaction. So now in a read-write transaction, there's another th like addition uh, which comes on top of this. So I basically do a read here, and then I update the, the, the values that I have gotten from my read. Now, as you can see, I'm putting that, all that into a transaction callable, as you can see up here, and I'm basically giving that whole um, 
object back to the read-write transaction to run. Why are we doing this? The thing is, the client libraries that we provide come with an automatic retry logic, so you don't have to take care of this. So in case of that the transaction gets aborted, um, the client will retry that transaction for you. So again, like everything that we are familiar with already, we basically put all the mutations in the transaction buffer, and if we run it and go back to our table, we can see here that we updated the name of uh, in my account. And last but not least, of course, I wanna do a, a cleanup, and there's one, another thing that you can do now, you can read data with uh, the client libraries with SQL, but you can also um, use our read APIs, and this is like a somewhat use of our read API, Basically, I'm selecting in my table everything in my account table on the key set all, which basically says all the rows in my account table I want to select, and then I'm uh, running this and clean up my table with that. So if you go back here and we go in the proof view, we have a clean table. All right, so some might ask, like, what about Spanner and the cap theorem? So if you look at the cap theorem, um, and that guy here on the right has formulated it um, a couple of years back, which basically talks about consistency, availability, and partitioning um, in a way like you have to pick two in distributed systems, or he's calling out basically in a distributed system, you have to pick two of these qualities. You cannot have all three uh, together. So what are the systems that are CA, that are basically always consistent and always available, um, where you basically never have partitions. The only system that are, exists that are available in that, and the, like you can ask about the availability, but um, these systems are basically single host systems. So thin, things that are running on a single host, um, you could say it's a CA system. Now, if you look at uh, AP system that are basically always available, also in the, in the case of a partitioning, of a network partitioning, you're looking at things of like Cassandra, Rick, or CouchDB, and if you look at things like um, systems that are always consistent, in the, uh, so basically that become unavailable in, in case of a network partition, you look th at things like Bigtable, MongoDB, BerkeleyDB, and things like that. Now, Spanner doesn't defeat any of this in a way that we are a CP system, but the likelihood of becoming unavailable is very, 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 very low. And the reason for that is multitude, um, mainly in if you look at the infrastructure and the hardware that Google has built over, uh, over a decade now, um, is in the quality so high up, um, and we are basically having all our like network owned between our data centers and things like that, that it's very unlikely that the majority of a Paxos group basically um, goes away and the system becomes available. But should that happen, there's always um, that like almost impossible situation, should that happen, we also result um, to consistency and basically the system would become unavailable. But in the case that happens, I think we have bigger problems. All right, so, um, with that, like if you want to try it out, we have a Google Cloud Platform free tier, uh, $300 that you can uh, get from us when you sign up, available for 12 months, and we have also some always free um, items uh, in our broader catalog on Google Cloud. Thank you very much. <laughs> we might have some time for questions, yes. So the query plan that I, I showed basically in the console, that the query plan, you get the execution plan. Um, we're currently working on tools to give you, give you more insight on the things like um, getting uh, hotspot information so that you basically see in the logs or is it getting like a visualized tool where you see like what is hotspotting, why is my bottleneck. So usually you, you can, which is not great, but usually you can see it in a way that you max out on, on your client side and you don't see the utilization coming up for, for your spanner nodes. So we have monitoring, some monitoring in place already, 
But yeah, basically you look at what could that be and we are adding tools. Yes? Sure. I have three questions in one. So first, what is the, um, the algorithm to partition data? Is it hash base or is it just a range of value? Second question, if it is range of value, um, do you rebalance automatically the data between the split, you call the split? And last question, if you do rebalancing, what happened to the consistency in the middle, in the middle of rebalancing? Mm -hmm. Very good questions, okay. So um, on what do we split? We split on range. So basically, um, like number ranges, if you could say. Um, so it's not hash or anything. It's, it's just a simple uh, range split. Now, in terms of rebalancing, what we basically do if we see that we get a hotspot on, on a split, we basically split that further and we distribute the responsibility for these splits among the compute resources that we have available. Now, what is in terms of the consistency? Though this, like Spanner is even in the case of that we do these rebalancing, a strong, consistent um, system. That is one of the main criteria about Spanner. If we would become even slightly inconsistent, even during our balances, the whole system wouldn't, wouldn't work, right? So what happens in the case that you basically have this re rebalancing? So we split basically the table or range, and then we um, give that responsibility from the pa current Paxos group to another Paxos group, which um, runs on different compute resources. And the, the biggest delay that you could have in that is about 10 seconds currently. But that really, really is the worst, 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 worst case. Usually, the, um, the rebalancing in terms of the giving over the responsibility to new Paxos groups is in milliseconds. Yes. So I have uh, two questions. Sure. One is, you said you support SQL and DL. Uh, do you support DML? You uh, showed that your inserts are in some custom library, but do you support a standard DML? Uh, and second question, you said that you need uh, to prepare your IDs uh, so they can be distributed. Uh, but is it a, uh, isn't a problem for indexes? So if I want to index a column uh, that is a timestamp, is it, isn't it a problem as well? Yes, um, so the first question was uh, DML. So currently we don't support DML, but we're working on it. Um, so during our EAP, it wasn't a feature which was heavily asked for, but we now get from the community that basically everybody wants a DML. Um, I wasn't in the decision to skip DML in the first place. Uh, I would have voted against it. But yeah, basically we were heavily working on DML and will come. Uh, second question was about indices. And yes, you're right, that is a concern, but basically, uh, you have to look at, like, if you have a lot of uh, load, basically, that you want to load your data, you, you, what you do is you create your indexes after the load. Now, if you have it in a common workload, you basically have to look as, like, can you maybe also shard your indexes in a way, right? So um, you have to be careful in terms of the indices, how you use them. That's definitely true. Any other questions? Five seconds left. There, over there, isn't it? Um, so Gmail, uh, Google Cloud Platform uses Spanner. Um, the App Store, like our like Play Store, is using Spanner. Um, a lot of the products that I'm not allowed to talk about, and <laughs> like most of the new um, products are using, so like our biggest system that like works on, on Spanner is our AdWords. Um, but by now we have around 1,000 was the last number that I heard, 1,000 products that were running on top of Spanner within Google. All right, with this, thank you very much again, and you can find me around if you have more questions. <laughs>